If you've ever wondered if you could have your own Wheatley in real life, or how you could build a personality core, in this video we'll dive into the details of how I designed my latest version of an animatronic Wheatley. So let's get started. First, how big are cores exactly? Well, the game model has quite a large design, but I'm going to annoy people by saying that's not accurate. It's just a compromise for better storytelling and gameplay. Why? Well, Wheatley is such an important character, he needs to be easily seen from a variety of distances. And if he were a more plausibly compact design, his charming detailed expressions and emotive outbursts would be lost. Also, he would look absolutely tiny when mounted on Gladys' body. But this isn't just like my opinion, man. While cores can navigate via the management rail system, assistance is needed for them to be inserted into the interface ports throughout the facility. And while Chell can effortlessly carry Wheatley via the portal gun, cores were seemingly handled by average humans on the regular. Case in point, we see Henry from the Lab Rat comic holding an early core. Now, that core isn't named, but it seems to be a much more human-friendly design, despite the hand-crushing gear train. We even get a nice profile view of him with the core. We don't know Henry's height, but giving him the average American male height of 69 inches, this puts the diameter of the core at about 16.5 inches. Now, I actually didn't consider the Lab Rat comic when designing my core, the size of which was actually just chosen to be proportional to this super cool round LCD, which makes mine about three quarters scale to the Lab Rat scale at about 333 millimeters in diameter. Also, yes, I mix measurement systems in my designs all the time. It's my legal obligation as an American to do so. And no, it doesn't bother me. It's like being ambidextrous, but one hand is perfectly normal with a full range of motion, and the other hand is a pirate hook. They each serve their own purpose in their own way. But you know what two systems you should never mix? Your private network and an unsecured internet connection. Which is why I'm glad that today's sponsor is Private Internet Access VPN. Now, I do a lot of online shopping for builds like this, which means I'm buying parts and materials from around the world. And I don't need my ISP peeking in the window and keeping track of every little thing that I do. So how do I keep them out? Well, with a virtual private network or VPN, and that's where private internet access comes in. They hide your IP address and safeguard your data through an encrypted tunnel. That way, your life is shielded from prying eyes who are looking to exploit your data. But the real question is, why should you trust private internet access? Well, because they are the world's most transparent VPN provider. They've got over 30 million downloads and they never record or store user data. And their no logs policy has been proven multiple times in court by a third party audit from Deloitte. And beyond safety, private internet access comes with loads of entertainment benefits. This VPN works with all major streaming services so that you can access more content than ever before. French Netflix, you got it. Hungarian Hulu, it's yours. I don't, maybe they've got some episodes of Firefly that you've never seen, maybe. Probably not, but maybe, hmm? And if you have a lot of devices like me, that's no problem, because you can use one private internet access subscription to protect an unlimited amount of devices at the same time. Signing up is risk-free. That's because private internet access has a 30-day money-back guarantee, and they've got 24-7 customer support there to help you out. Now, does all that service come at a high price? No. I could tell you the full price, or you could use my link in the description, that's piavpn.com forward slash Mr. Volt, and then you would save 83% off a private internet access subscription. That's only $2.03 a month for extra peace of mind and security. Also, subscribers who use my link will get four extra months completely free. Now that's a deal. Thanks again to Private Internet Access for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to talking about Wheatley. That's right, the core of my core is this beautiful 3.4 inch circular LCD. It looks odd, but it's not hard to use. As far as the computer's concerned, it's actually an 800 by 800 square display with a handy mini HDMI input and USB power connection. Now this unit has plenty of pixels to portray any of the personality core irises, but that's only part of the equation. Wheatley also has a very active iris mechanism, and while the in-game model just swaps out a texture whenever he adjusts his aperture, I want a physical solution. And while you can buy mechanical irises, I need one that's fairly large, which means that any off-the-shelf solution would be expensive and likely too heavy. So I had to make my own. Now, this is a solved design problem, so I just used an online calculator, popped in my necessary dimensions, and I was almost there. 
one side of the mechanism needs to be driven. So I added a gear tooth profile along a 90 degree arc that is driven by a smaller pinion gear that will be attached to a small servo. Now we need to figure out how to make the blades, which is harder than it seems. The more blades an iris has, the thinner the bezel can be, but the blades also have to be lightweight and rigid. The issue here is that Wheatley has an incredibly thin bezel relative to his aperture size, which should mean that I can just add more blades, right? Well, the blades also have to be incredibly thin as they stack on top of each other. I settled in a 16 blade assembly, which at only 0.2 millimeters thick per blade strikes a nice balance between bezel width and blade count, which I want to keep down because they are a chore to make. The mechanism of this type of iris requires the blades to have opposing pins on either end. The blade is too delicate to be printed with support material. So I split each blade into two pieces, one main blade with an integrated pin and an absolutely tiny separate pin that's meant to be super glued into the matching hole. Is this silly? Maybe. Does it work? I'm happy with it, actually. And if you have any ideas how to make this kind of blade assembly easier, I would love to know, so please leave a comment. All right, let's walk back through the whole eye assembly. First, there's the outer eyepiece, which has bores for the blades to rotate in. Then there's the stack of 16 blades, followed by the driven slot ring. Then we've got an adapter plate that keeps the driven ring from falling out. And after that comes the LCD itself, and another retaining piece that holds the LCD and provides a mounting point for the iris drive servo. The rear of this piece has a matching hole profile so I can mount the LCD driver board. Now, behind all of this, we have the next major piece, which has integrated standoffs that provide clearance for the driver and mounting hub, and more standoffs for a Raspberry Pi Zero 2W, and mounting holes for two 3-watt speakers, because the LCD driver board has an integrated audio amplifier. So when it's attached via this mini HDMI cable to the Pi, I've got audio and video in one tidy package. Now, Wheatley's inner eye needs to pan and tilt as well. So the eye assembly is supported by an aluminum universal joint. Now to drive this motion, there are two rotating blocks aligned with the axes of the U-joint. This way, the push rods that actuate the mechanism are decoupled, which means that I can pan without affecting tilt at all. And now, in the Portal 2 commentary, Valve said that Wheatley's eyelids were mechanically impossible. In this case, impossible is just a matter of perspective. Wheatley's eyelids aren't mechanically magical, but if they were designed as they appear in the game, they would peak above his face ring. So the trick to solving this problem isn't that complicated. If the design were to be circular and rotating about his central axis, the eyelids would peak above the face immediately. We can help this by reducing the profile of the eyelid to just barely cover the eye hole, but that's only part of the solution. If we want to fully open the eyelids while keeping them hidden behind the ring, all you have to do is reduce the length of the eyelid arms to be less than or equal to the radius of the face ring. This brings the axis of the eyelid rotation forward, but that's not a problem. So now we can rotate the eyelid to fully hide them within the ring. See Valve? Was that so hard? Now in the game model, Wheatley's face is driven by a practical mechanism called a Stuart platform, which is a pretty cool motion platform that allows for translation in three axes and rotation about those same axes. Wheatley is highly expressive, so this is a great plausible explanation for how he could move if it weren't for a few problems. See, two of the translation axes aren't used as Wheatley's face doesn't move straight up or down or left and right. And lastly, the rotation about this axis is redundant as while his face does twist, all Stuart platforms have fairly limited rotation until it starts to intersect itself. So there has to be a separate motor to allow his face to fully rotate, which happens to be the only clearly modeled motor in his design. Also, the platform definitely gets in the way of the eyelids in this case. So I've ditched the Stuart platform for my own design, which allows for panning, tilting, and popping in and out. The pan and tilt motions are driven by separate servos, just like the inner eye mechanism, but bigger. A push rod connects to a swivel, aligned with the universal joint, and the servos are mounted on a plate toward the rear. Now, to add this ability, I designed the whole eye and face assembly to rest on two linear bearings that ride on six millimeter shafts that fit into a larger rotating component. The third servo here is what drives the entire eye and face assembly in and out. So at max extension, his face just barely clears the inner shells, and when fully retracted, he pulls in six millimeters. All right, so that might not sound like a lot, but it was really tight to cram this mechanism inside because the thickness of all the motors and components limits how much I can retract. In order for 
Wheatley's face to be able to twist, I mounted the linear motion shafts inside a larger tube component, which itself rests on two large bearings that are spaced apart. Now there's another gear mounted at the rear, which meshes with a matching gear attached to another servo mounted on the gimbal. Wheatley's inner body can fully rotate within the outer shells, which is one of the most complex aspects of his motion that requires a fundamental redesign of his chassis compared to the game, which doesn't really exist. If his whole inner body can fully rotate, that means the outer shells aren't fixed relative to each other. This gets even weirder if you consider how he'd move while attached to a management rail arm or a docking port, because that attachment is made to his inner body, which means it's fixed in place. So the motors, let's just assume these discs are motorized, would spin the outer shells. So the rigid attachment needs to be made to the outer shells and locked together. But how? There isn't room for a central shaft, as that would block the internal face assembly. And if that were adjusted to have a large opening to allow that assembly to move, this still wouldn't be a solution, as this structural element has to allow clearance for the entire inner body to rotate. Now, this wouldn't look right at all, so I split the difference, and the solution actually solves another mechanical oddity in Wheatley's design. These sliding arc segments, which are pushed by his face. At first glance, they seem fine, but their axes of rotation intersect, which means they would clip through each other at the rear, but since the laws of physics don't apply in video games, they don't. But I need to figure a way to make this work. So I decided to make the vertical arc move accurately, since it's the more visible piece, and I designed it with a small flange that will ride in these curved slotted pieces, which mounts to this stainless steel bracket in the front and a composite plate near the rear of the gimbal. These two plates not only support the arc assembly, but the inner shell quarters as well, each of which rests on a little flange right here and screws in at the back. But what about the other arc? Well, because the horizontal arc aligns with Wheatley's pitch axis, I decided that it should be rigid and act as the supporting element that holds everything in place. To do this, I extend the arc outside his frame, trying to strike a balance between keeping it minimal while sturdy. Driving the pitch axis is handled by this beefier servo with a 3 to 2 reduction mounted on the gimbal, which, as part of the inner assembly, contains all of the motors so far but we need to power and communicate with the servos that drive the handle mechanisms. So how do we do that without the wires getting snagged as he rotates? Solution, this little thingamajigger right here. This is a slip ring and allows for a rotating electrical joint to pass power. The little bearing in the slip ring is too small for my liking. So the slip ring is recessed and fits snugly within the gimbal and a much larger 30 millimeter bearing takes the load. Now the wires can then feed through this slot on the outer frame and then up or down to their respective servos, which drive the handles. Wheatley's handles basically act as his eyebrows, so to make them responsive, each handle mechanism is driven by one small smart servo that has a little nylon pulley that connects to the cutest timing belt you've ever seen. Seriously, I love these things. These wee timing belts attach to another large pulley in a 2 to 1 reduction that is affixed to the shaft that rests in the lever arm of the handle. This whole handle mechanism rests on an aluminum plate that holds the servo and the bearing for the shaft. The plates attach to the chassis via two 20 millimeter spacers, and there's a matching plate and bearing on the other side of the assembly, but those are idlers. The whole assembly is driven only on the right side. Now this whole arrangement is another tight fit as the inner assembly has to rotate past the handle mechanisms, which it does with just a couple millimeters to spare. I designed Wheatley's outer shells as monolithic pieces, where the ports for the handles and the large side rings are integrated. Each shell half screws into the horizontal arc assembly via these four holes. Now Wheatley's game model doesn't have any visible screws, but adding external holes to the chamfered ring here makes assembly a breeze, and I like the extra bit of visual detail. Plus, I've already modified his chassis anyway, so I might as well make my life, and theoretically your life if you ever build a Wheatley, easier too. Now, I think that's looking pretty good, but there's still a lot more design work to do. If you have more questions about the mechanical assembly, let me know. I'll talk more about the electronics in the next video when I put them together, and yes, I'm also making a management rail for him too. So subscribe to see the next update, thanks for watching, and special thanks to my Patreon supporters. Kynan Plays Games, I salute you.